Bibles to Acts 26. This is where we are. This is the second part of the sermon in this chapter, in Acts 26. And last week we said that in this area of persuasion, part eight, it's that kind of, it makes sense of life. The gospel makes sense of life. Today is the gospel just makes sense sense. The gospel just makes sense. And so if you'll go to verse 19 with me, we'll read there all the way to the end, and then we'll get into the word together. 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, Paul has just made his personal testimony. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. And this is kind of what he, what he it's a big time summary verse that's very, very important. He says, everything that the prophets of Moses have ever said, this is what I say. Ready? He says that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as, as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind. Most excellent Festus, I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. May God bless the reading of his word today. So this is part B. So let's kind of do a recap and kind of see where we're at. This is the fourth address that Paul has given ever since he's been kind of grabbed and, you know, become a prisoner. And this is a very sophisticated and persuasive engagement that Paul is having in front of this royal crowd. Everyone's in the room. There's authorities and powers and power players all in the room. Some call it the high point of Paul's addresses, and I would agree. You know, he has had other times where he speaks in the book of Acts where he's, you know, he's, whether he's doing it, you know, in, in Athens or in other places. But this is one of his high points, just the type of things that he addresses and speaks of. And Paul had a very specific goal. And I showed you last week that he mentions Agrippa's name often and he speaks of his royal title often. Paul is on a mission to convert Agrippa. He is trying to speak in such a way that would drive Agrippa to make a decision. And basically he says in verse 28, Agrippa picks up on it. He goes, are you trying to convert me? And Paul goes, I want everyone to be like me except for these chains. And so he wasn't hiding what he was doing and he was trying to persuade. And what we're talking about is persuading people. We're talking today um, to understand what that looks like. Why, why is a Christian called to have this type of argumentation and conversation that we are called to persuade? And some people really have a really hard time with this area, right? Because, you know, are you trying to convert me? If somebody responded to you at your workplace or on the phone or a friend, and they said to you, whoa, 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 Terry, happy birthday. If Terry's talking to somebody on the phone and they said, Terry, are you trying to convert me? it would get quite awkward on that phone call because she would probably say, uh, kind of, yes, right? Because that feels very, very much in your face. And so 
We are called to do that, even though we don't feel the most comfortable with it. So how are people ultimately persuaded? And I, I'm, I'm kind of coming from a secular perspective here, just so you know, because there's studies about this. It's very complex. When somebody changes their mind or somebody be, changes their worldview, it is never some real simple explanation for why or how that happened. How was somebody persuaded? And yes, we use all three of these, reason, experience, and evidence. They're used in a great way to help people, right, finally have that shift of mind and heart. And I mentioned last week that there are limitations on a single approach. There's a reason why persuasion is multifaceted and why it's that way here in Acts 26, because it's not as simple as you think, okay? And so I, I talked about last week how there was this movement during the Enlightenment and people eventually were saying, we've got to get rid of the superstition. We've got to get rid of religion. And if we can do that, guess what? Peace is coming. Because the real problem in the world is all these religious people. That if reason would come to the forefront, then there would be peace. And we know that the two big ideologies that came from that time frame were Marxism and capitalism. And none of them have brought peace, have they? Right? Those arguments are happening even as we speak today. So you could be the most secular person in the world and you would still, you know, not be convinced just by that alone. And I want to make another case, right? The supreme call to witnesses. There's this idea that I really pushed last week that God's design is that us persuading and convicting and, you know, collaborating with people is because we're called to do that. We're called to be these mouthpieces, to be witnesses for the Lord. And I just want to kind of highlight through the text that we're in, the words that Paul uses about what God told him to do. Just to see, right, how witnessing, all right, the call to persuade other people is really important. In verse 16, Paul says, he made me a witness. In verse 17, he was sending me out. In verse 20, he called me to declare. In 22, I was testifying. So see, in Paul's mind, when he was converted and made a Christian, Jesus really quickly said, okay, now your job is to go be a witness for me and to live in this world doing these things. And so there is a supreme call, what I would say, to personal witness. And that was the case I made last, last week. Paul primarily shares the gospel through his personal testimony. Yes, you know, a fun project. There's two projects I'm going to give you today if you wanted to. But you could go through the book of Acts and say, okay, every time that Paul is making a defense or an argument for Christianity, what, what, what does he tend to use as, you know, one of the primary tools? And it's his testimony. His personal testimony is often given, like God prophesied over Paul that he would speak before kings and authorities and that one day he would get to Rome. And what is Paul going to do when he gets those platforms? He's going to share his testimony. And I think it's one of the primary things. You're not called to be a judge and you're not called to be a lawyer. You're called to be a witness to God's saving and keeping power in your life. And this is why it is so critical, right, that we know how to share our God story, how God has changed us uh, in such a way that people could hear the gospel. Paul was able to do, to do that. But I want to talk another, you know, last week I talked about limitations on persuasion, and one of them was on reason, right? That own reason can take us so far. Today I want to talk about a limitation, the second one, and it's about data, because I'm about to go down that line. Paul uses, uh, as one of his arguments in his persuasive speech, he's going to use this concept of, I've got facts on my side. And um, no one will ever remember the facts. Did you know if you and I went to like a conference on why the Bible is true? right? And you and I go to that weekender, and we get all kinds of data, and we go to all kinds of workshop. And I remember years ago, I was listening, listening to John Piper while I was jogging. That must have been years ago. Hey, you got that one. Good. And so I was listening to John Piper while I was jogging. I remember he said that 
when he was young in the ministry, he always wanted to, to make sure that he had all these arguments figured out, that he had the data, that he could convince people about the Bible or about Christianity. And he goes, every time I finally sat down on the plane and there was somebody next to me and they were asking about Christianity and he was a professor at a university. I'm like, oh good, I'm going to use all this data that I've had. He goes, I could never remember the facts. And he said, that's not, it, it was, it, it, all of a sudden I was put in these positions and I was like, oh, I heard that great argument at that conference or at that apologetic thing. And he goes, and I just, I, I couldn't remember exactly the way that I was taught it. And he, it always frustrated him. And I think that's one thing that you and I need to remember, that scholarly defenses of the scriptures are important for the church. Like that we have scholastic evidences and argumentation and cases to be made are wonderful, but are not the sure foundation of, any, of anyone's conversion to Christ. And I think there is a limitation if you said, oh, all I need is data. And I could be a faithful witness to Christ. The reality is you cannot remember all of it. And I want to show you at the end of the sermon today that the design of Scripture, the way that, the way that God converts people, it is not through data. That God, God doesn't convert people, you know, just because somebody makes the most logical argument. God has designed it that our eyes are open and hearts are awakened to the glory of Jesus. And when people come to Christ, it's because they see the glory of him. He begins to shine. He begins to make sense. He begins to answer longings in people's lives and hearts. And that is exactly the way that God has so designed how people are ultimately converted and persuaded. So, Let's go to Paul's argument. Last week was personal. He, it relates to life. It just makes sense of life. He was able to tell them his commitment and his story, his background, how Jesus interrupted all that. And then he's going to make a rational argument today through our text and then a historical one. So let's go ahead and jump in. We saw personal last week. Paul's argument on the part that is rational. So where does this show up? It shows up when uh, Festus responds to him and he tells him, you are out of, your mind, out of your mind. You are out of your mind. And Paul responds to him and says, no, 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 no. I am not out of my mind. I am speaking true and rational words. This is Paul. This is his case. He's got an audience. And he goes, Festus, I am not crazy. I am very true and very rational at this moment. And why does he say that? Because Paul is going to focus on reasonable and public evidence. And he basically is saying, no, 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 Christianity is 100% rational. I'm not speaking out of turn. I'm not talking, you know, out of, out of thin air. I am speaking a very rational and real case. And so how does he do that? See, Paul could point to evidence. What Paul is doing is that I can point to evidence and he's going to tell him why he can do that. Well, one of the main reasons, I think, is because of who his audience was. I mean, King Agrippa was eight years old when Jesus was raised from the grave. <laughs> I mean, this happened in King Agrippa's lifetime. And so he's sitting there and going, whoa, 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 Festus, you're an outsider. You're not from here. You're pagan. But time out. My people that are in here, they know what I'm saying is true and rational. See, and then he says, I don't know if you caught it, he said Christianity was not happening in some secret corner. None of these things, he said, happen in a corner. They happen right out in public for all to see. And this is the argumentation that Paul is using. And he uses kind of two things. Two lines of evidence, I think, that are in his mind and his heart as he is communicating and making this case. Cultural movement and resurrection. Those are the two cases there. The two things here, cultural movement and, or, and resurrection. So let's talk about cultural movement. This has happened multiple times as we've been watching Paul make his defense. And he said often that like, Christians or followers of the way are making a huge impact. They are changing society. They're getting well known. They're becoming 
um, in some ways, right, a nuisance. These people are converting, and these people are willing to die. And, and one of the ways you know that they're having an impact, right, is to watch the people who are in authority. So what is the reaction of authorities in the book of Acts towards Christianity? How did they respond when this movement is growing and people are really like making... I mean, we've seen so much cultural issues, right? We've seen that there were silversmiths and ways of making income and populations and people with demon spirits and, um, you know, people made their living certain ways. And guess what was happening? Christianity was turning those cultures and societies around. And that, guys, was not happening in some corner. People knew about these things. Jewish authorities were illogically, right, doing everything to eradicate Christianity. We've made that case already. Guys, the way that the Jewish authorities were acting was irrational. Paul had been in prison for two years and they had not forgotten. People had taken codes of, of famine and saying, uh, um, I'm sorry, not famine. What is it when you don't eat? What is it called? Fasting, all right? Um, they made, uh, you know, I'm going to fast. I'm, ne I'm never going to eat anything until I kill this man. And so these people were irrational. Two years later, Paul's in prison. They have not changed their mind. We talked about the fact that if they chose to invade and attack a party of Roman soldiers taking Paul to some place, it would ultimately end into a riot and possibly death for many, many people. So you know, Paul says, that none of this is happening in some dark corner. Everybody can tell and attest to what's happening here. And Rome did as well. They were an authority figure. It started off passive. In the early stages, it was King Agrippa I. You know, we know that he beheaded some, some early Christian leaders. We know that um, he, he scattered some Christians out. Not only were the Jewish people doing persecution, but so was this Roman uh, leader here, Agrippa, in the early times. But we know it's going to go full bore very soon, right? Under the Nero persecution, we have horrible, horrible persecution uh, on, a, on a very wide scale. So guess what Paul is thinking? Paul could assume that anyone in the Middle East could not laugh off or dismiss what is happening to the Christian movement. You are out of your mind, Festus says. Paul goes, no, no, no. I speak true and rational words. There is evidence about this, and you can just look at culture for that. But I want to highlight where he always went to and why he's on trial class. I always want you to know this, right? If you ever have biblical jeopardy someday. <laughs> Why was Paul on trial? Because of the resurrection. Because he believed and adhered to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And he, in his mind, believing in the resurrection, in these miracles that had taken place, was completely rational. A famous passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which makes this huge discussion and argumentation for the resurrection. But he says, Paul says, Therefore I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So when Paul used to speak of, hey, I'm going to preach Christ and the fact that he's been raised from the dead and share that with you, in his mind he goes, there's over 500 people you can go talk to right now that know it happened. And many of them are still alive, right? And he makes that case about them. So this resurrection argument to Paul is very reasonable. You know, there's many reasons to believe in the resurrection, and I'm not here to make that case today. But there are many reasons. Just one of them, just so you know from, from many authors, has been that there are strange, res, the, the, what they call the strange resurrection account. You know, it's really odd to write the Bible the way the Bible is written, okay? And you have things like women being the very first witnesses to the tomb. Or you have people who had 
total disbelief in the fact that their leader was raised from the dead. They were in disbelief. They were in fear. They were cowering. They were running. They weren't in some type of position of confidence and boldness. There was this crazy rapid change, right, that took place. And the fact of the matter is, I don't think you and I can connect with this, but I think the people that are in the room with Paul could. Guys, there was miracles everywhere. Miracles everywhere. You and I don't get it. There was miracles everywhere. It wasn't, guys, they don't have social media like we do, right? They don't have a TV. They don't have media being distributed. But in, in the Middle East, I remember John MacArthur at one time had this like great like, like unpacking of how many miracles just, just Jesus did alone. He goes, he was eradicating diseases and all kinds of stuff in the Middle East, right, during his time on earth. But we know from John, when we went through John as a church, 21 verse 25, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Jesus healed people, brought people from the dead. Like, there were so many miracles and this time where he, Paul is being addressed, right, by these, by these royal people and these authorities, many of them know it. They've heard of it. They've seen it. But not only in Jesus' time, but also in the time of the apostles. And I, I almost did this, but I decided to hold off because I didn't want to bore you. But I was going to just tell you, I'm going to do a quick survey of the book of Acts every time a miracle took place. I'm not going to do that. But it says, and now... Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So in Acts chapter 4, in the early stages, there is this movement of miracles. And we see it over and over and over again. People healed. People brought back, right? It's just... Miracles were everywhere, and you and I, I think, are very disconnected to that. But when Paul says, I am not out of my mind, why? There are people that saw Jesus raised from the dead. There are tons of people who have seen miracles. And the fact of the matter is that there are thousands that could testify to these miracles. Thousands. That is my cousin. He was born paralyzed. That is my sister who was, you know, mentally insane. I mean, there were thousands of people that could attest to these things. And so, to him, this is very rational. The resurrection, guys, is key, though. It is often stated that resurrection makes Christianity the most irritating religion on earth. Because if you can just get rid of the resurrection, it all can fall into place. But it's the one kind of linchpin miracle of all miracles that is the game changer. And the only way I can kind of tell you this is by reading a smarter person than myself about what he says about the resurrection. It is not enough for the skeptic then to simply dismiss the Christian teaching about the resurrection of Jesus by saying, it just couldn't have happened. That's, that's not logical enough, right? He or she must face and answer all of these historical questions. Why did Christianity emerge so rapidly with such power? No other band of messianic followers in that era concluded their leader was raised from the dead. Why did this group do so? No group of Jews ever worshipped a human being as God. What led them to do it? What changed worldviews virtually overnight? How do you account for the hundreds of eyewitnesses to the resurrection who lived on for decades and publicly maintained their testimony, eventually giving their lives for their beliefs? See, this is a, this is a real uh, spur in the saddle, is the resurrection of Christ. And so from his mind and heart, Paul is saying, I am not a lunatic. I speak true and rational words. And I want you to know that as Christians, when you have to make a defense or an argument or try to persuade somebody, I know you might feel at times a little bit huitado and, oh, I feel like, you know, you know the academic world calls me an, an ignorant person and then I'm a numbskull. 
fooey with that. Christianity is totally rational, completely true. Every day, right, they continue to discover things in the Middle East and archaeology. And oh my word, they said that all of this stuff in the Old Testament was just fanciful, you know, um, kind of, you know, made up stuff. And now they're finding out like, wait a second, they're right where they said that building was going to be at was there. And they're discovering this over and over and over again. Christianity is absolutely 100% rational. That's not only the case that he's now made. Right? He's made a personal testimonial case. He's made a rational case. But he makes now a historical one. And this is where Paul challenges Agrippa very, very clear. And he says this in verse 27. You believe the prophets, King Agrippa. I know you do. You say, what is he going after with that? Paul basically is telling King Agrippa, look at the historical biblical account. It will speak for itself. Now, this is an interesting way for him to go because I would not have thought that he would have done it. I don't think he would have done it to Festus. But he does it to King Agrippa and the other Jewish audience that is in the room. And this has been a normal tactic of Paul's. Paul goes to this often. When Paul is making a case, again, I, I was going to get in real nerdville in this, and I decided not to. But when Paul is making a case, I said, hey, I, I'm going to look up every time that Paul makes an argument through the Scripture, the Old Testament, defending or making you know, his, his, um, his appeal for Christ. And it's pretty amazing how much of that he actually does. Of course, we know that in the epistles. It's like crazy. I was just talking about the book of Acts. So Paul was completely committed to the biblical affirmation and confirmation of Jesus. In his mind, when I believe in Christ, I'm just believing the Old Testament. When I believe what I believe, it's because I am seeing the whole thing come together. I'm a respecter of the Pentateuch and of the law. So I want to give you kind of a survey of Paul's commitment to scriptural argument and focus. And there's a lot of places that could have gone. But this is what he says here in chapter 26 and 22, 22. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying to both small and great. And this is interesting. I'm saying nothing else. I'm not adding to it. I'm not taking away. But when I speak, I speak of the prophets and Moses. When I speak, I am... I am being honorable, right? I am bringing to fruition. I am dealing with the Old Testament in the proper way. And I, I underline this for you because in his mind, if he's being faithful to the prophets and to, the, and to Moses in the Old Testament, he says that what he's about to say is being faithful to that. And this is what he says. I'm being faithful to that by saying that Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. Paul basically says the Old Testament is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Everything in the Old Testament is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. All of it. And that is what he's trying to make a case for. So, I told you I could have gone all over the place, but I'm not. This is a really good place here in Acts 17. And so he says, like, as was my custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. There's no New Testament, right? There's some letters, but they're not, you know, put together. He reasoned from them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. And some of the Jews were persuaded. So what Paul is doing here with King Agrippa and this audience is he is literally using what he has been using in his ministry all the time. This is no new thing. He says, this is the way I've always approached you. I go to the Old Testament and I show you from the scriptures that Jesus is the fruition of everything that has been written in the Old Testament. And the sad fact is that the Jews were blind to what was right in front of them. Now I'm going to bring this together at the end, but 
what, what they were totally committed to, what you and I cannot even comprehend, memorizing the Pentateuch, guys, memorizing Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy, these people were more committed. They would put all of us to shame in their absolute commitment, and yet they were so committed, and yet they were so blind. And a place that really brings clarity, clarity to this is in John chapter 5. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says what? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. What he's saying is, the scripture is all about me and bearing witness to me. Later on in that passage, he says, if you had believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote of me. And he uses this kind of argument all the time. He goes, if you love the Father, you'd love me. And if you believe the Father, you'd believe me. He does this all the time. But what he's really getting at right now is he's saying, time out, time out. If you really knew the scriptures, you would know me. Because it's all about me. And so, I told you I, was only, I wasn't going to go Nerdville in two other places. I'm going to go Nerdville now. We got to go through the Gospel of John as a church, and it was so, so good. And one of the key words in the Gospel of John was the word witness. I think it, it comes out like 48 times or something like that, maybe 52, depending on a variance. And so the whole book is about like this, making this witness that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Big, big proclamation. This is what we're all about. And the way that the word witness is used is, is that somebody is affirming and saying, this is true. And so how do the scriptures say that Jesus is true? And there's, I could have done tons of verses, but I'm just going to run through them. And what you see is that you see all of these times where the Old Testament is used in the middle of Jesus' ministry to affirm and declare Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Period. And so here are some of them. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. A reference to Psalm 41, 9. They hated me without of cause. Psalm 35, 19. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. And this is an, I love when it has these little, like, you know, little phrases that, oh, so that the scripture could be fulfilled. Psalm 109, 8. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Psalm 22, 18. Jesus said, isn't this amazing? One of the reasons Jesus said this on the cross is to fulfill scripture. Psalm 20, 69, 21. Not one of his bones will be broken. Psalm 34, 20. They will look on him on whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12, 10. As they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Psalm 16, 10. And that just is trying to show you how the scriptures are a witness in and of themselves about Jesus. Do you understand how Paul is doing this now? I'm going to give you a persuasive speech to trust in Christ. Let me tell you my story. Two, let's talk about what we see around us. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, right? I don't know. He did. There's witnesses. There's people. There's miracles happening everywhere. How do you, how do you speak about those? And what he often did was to go right to religious people and say, hey, I want to persuade you how the scriptures have always talked about this, that Jesus would come and die and rise again. The scriptural witness of Jesus. Please note this, that the point of scripture is the gospel. The point of scripture is to point us to the gospel. Christ must suffer. This is his little summary. That whoever is there is going to suffer. There's going to be a lamb. He's going to be slain. His blood must be shed. He must make remission for sin on our behalf. He will be the firstborn from the dead. He will bring with him the first fruits of many other resurrections to defeat sin and death. And he would be the hope of the world. 
To not just Jews only, but to the Gentiles as well. A light to all the nations. As we saw last week, Simeon looked forward to who? The hope of the Gentiles. Jesus Christ is the central point of Scripture. And I just want to encourage you that when you're talking to people and, and you go like, oh, I feel a little bit awkward and I'm not, I'm not going to use, the, you should use it. You should, you should be feel free like, man, if you understood how the Bible is put together and how it all speaks about Christ and how it, it develops and brings to fruition. And this is why like, I love at Christmas time, I listen, and I'll do it once or it's, it's going to be July. I might do it sometimes in July as well. But I listened to this album by Andrew Peterson called Behold the Lamb. And you, you can't sit down and listen to one song and shut it off. You just can't. You need to, when you listen to that album, it begins with a song about, hey, there's a story to tell. And it takes you from the, that and all through the Exodus and through the Passover. And it takes you to the time of prophets and the time of longing and a time of of finally Jesus showing up and being born and one day what? He is slain to be the Lamb of God. And it takes you to the storyline and you go, it all makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Jesus is the central point. And so when you read the Bible that it is mainly about Jesus, the whole thing comes alive. And I know I've told you, uh, I made an admonition to do this. When you read the Bible, don't read just for promises, principles, or practices. Don't. You'll get bored like that. Read to find a person. Literally open up the Psalms and go, show me Jesus in Psalms today. I'm going to read this. Oh, look at that. Who is the righteous one that would one day stand before me? It's Jesus. That's right. So learn to not read just for promises, practices, and principles, but read for a person. And something about that, guys, I can't explain it. The personal and the rational all come together in the fruition of the scriptures. They, they speak to reality. They speak to some type of sense. Now, I told you earlier, remember the limitation of reason and data. Don't forget that. It's not about that you know all the data. And that you have it all logically figured out. I don't understand this. This is where I think it's the glory of Christ that takes this to a whole new level. But I think what happens is, in Christ it all comes together. And somehow the glory of Christ is the thing that starts to go, even if I can't make sense of it all, boy do I want it to make sense. I, I want it to make sense. I... I, I want somebody who dies for, right, their enemies. And so there's a famous thing. I think I, I mentioned it last week, so if I'm redundant, forgive me. Dick Lucas was a famous pastor in England, and uh, he used to do all these little business luncheons. Like We would call it like a 30-minute teaching time, and people used to come, and they would eat lunch, and they would listen to him for 30 minutes. And one of the guys just, this, he was from Cambridge, came up to me and goes, listen, 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 Dick. Give me a watertight argument for the existence of God, and then I will believe. And he goes, I'm so sorry that there's no such thing. That's not, that's not the way the Bible is written. The Bible is not written so that you can have somebody and beat them up in an argument. And, no, no. What if God sent a watertight person who in the end there can be no argument? What if, what if God sent a watertight person? See, when the gospel is faithfully expressed, this is how conversion works. This is how you and I cross the line, right, from unbelief to belief. What happens is, when the gospel is faithfully and fully expressed, the grounds of conversion is the glory of Christ. No one goes, ah, oh, you gave me a three-point argument. Today I believe. Whenever you and I believe and are converted and move towards um, trusting right in God, it's because we've seen the glory of Christ. He begins to do what we see in verse 18. What were some of the things that Paul was called to do in this chapter? He says, 
I was called to be a witness, to declare, to go forth, to do what? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. See, this is what it is to be converted. When the gospel is fully expressed, the glory of Christ is on display, and what God does is a miracle. God grants us to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's exactly what takes place. Jesus is real. Oh, I want him to be real. There's got to be somebody that can make things right. There is somebody that will wipe away every tear. This is what it means to have new birth. The opening of the eyes of, of the blind to see what is really there. I don't want to go there too long, but it was really uh, interesting. Uh, there's a whole, again, it was by John Piper years ago, but he kind of said the whole point of this passage of, of, of God taking us from darkness to light is to say that it's so evident that it's right in front of you. Because something that's in the light is evident to everybody. But Satan is blinding you and me to not see what is duh in front of us. That one of the things that happens to Christians is that they go, duh, of course there needs to be a savior. Of course there needs to be somebody that is going to fix this and, and make it right. There's got to be a holy judge, right? There's got to be a day where, where somebody who's done evil is going to be held to account. And it all begins just to make sense. And the devil is literally on a mission to keep us blind to that reality. So what is Paul's goal with this address? It's no doubt. He is here persuading Agrippa and the audience. He uses all the tools he can. I will tell you again, I believe he would say that the strongest case is a changed life. That there's nothing that compares to, and this, there was old dead dudes who always talked about, oh, we got to go give the gospel to Indians, or we got to give the gospel to a, a tribe where they're illiterate and they don't read and write. What do we do? What do we do? And they would all try to sit down and go, what should we do? Let me tell you, it's not about data and it's not ultimately about logic and you having all those things figured out. It's about changed lives. It is the strongest argument that Jesus is real. C.H. Spurgeon, I used this last week. I use it again in a condensed form. Heads are won by reasoning, but hearts are won by witness bearing. Argument which appeals only to the intellect is poor fuel with which to kindle the fire of love to Christ. Even sound instruction will not suffice without personal witness to vivify and support it. Bear witness to what you know, to what you feel, to the power of Christ to pacify the conscience and to change the life. Bear, I say, your witness to Jesus. And you will have done, which God will bless to the opening of the eyes of the spiritually blind. This is what it's about. Dear friends, the gospel just makes sense, doesn't it? It really does. Once the darkness is pulled away, you're like, yes, we are truly broken people. <laughs> As Juan was trying to make an appeal, apart from God, everything we perform would never merit God's favor, ever. It's all paint, uh, poison. It's all polluted. We need an advocate. We need somebody's perfect obedience, and we have that in Christ Jesus. The fact of the matter is, is that we all long for someone like Jesus to really be true. We all long for someone like Jesus to be true. If there could be only a king who serves the subjects, is there a king like that? If there could be the strong who is gentle to the weak, is, is there some strong person there who really handles the, the weak in a gentle way? A bruised reed he will not break. If there could be a judge who reconciles the guilty, and our judge does it by punishing himself. Is there such a thing as a king and the strong and the judge who
who will do those things. And dear friend, there is a water type person. And his name is Jesus. That will deal with your doubts and deal with your struggles and meet you where you are. And even if you don't have it all figured out, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will persuade you that you're a sinner, that you're lost, and that you need a Savior. And that's why the glory of Jesus will ultimately shine. Would you stand to our feet? I hope this encourages you as a church to continue, to continue longing and persevering and desiring that we be faithful disciple makers. You know, the book of Acts is giving us the tools, the foundation to think biblically about these things. And so it's with great joy, right, that we continue to memorize and to say the Great Commission together. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now go be what you are. Be the church. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ooh. Ooh.